an especially dear friend who uh, passed away a night in 2014. A dear friend who did some incredibly important work that the world should know about. And so many people uh, unfortunately don't. And that was the work of Dr. Roger Lear, L-E-I-R. You can go on the web and type in Dr. Roger Lear, L-E-I-R, and you will see the most fantastic stuff that he was able to do, phenomenally interesting, where he was able to, and he became famous worldwide for doing this particular work. He was a he was a podiatrist and uh, was used to cutting on people and operating, and so he got involved uh, many years ago by chance. Uh, and maybe Paul can tell you more about that in a, in a moment. But uh, he got involved, Dr. Lear got involved in uh, alien implants. Uh, people were finding, uh, you know, if you, if you fall and break your arm or, or sprain your wrist or, or something, you need to get an X-ray. And when people would get X-rays, they would find in the X-ray a little small uh, a piece of metal uh, in their body, in their foot, leg, toe, arm, hand, whatever. And, uh, and But it wasn't bothering them. Normally, if you get a piece of metal inside the human body anywhere, it's going to show itself very quick. Uh, and but uh, but people find that there were little metal particles in their body, and they wouldn't know about it unless they happened by chance to get a uh, an X-ray and it showed up. And so for some reason, Dr. Lear, I got involved with one of those cases and uh, decided it was in the leg, I believe, or in the foot of one person, and so he operated and cut into the foot and found this little uh, metal object. Um, and that began a whole operation. That began a whole career uh, for Dr. Roger Lear that he later became world famous for because he discovered that this little piece of metal uh, was actually uh, transmitting an electrical signal and they were able to find out he sent the little piece of metal to uh to I think it was one of the uh Paul might remember the name of the uh the laboratory I think it's in New Mexico and uh they reported back to him that this metal did not have the the ingredients from metals have on the earth so the obvious uh, the metal did not come from the earth and uh, and uh, it was some kind of a device that was beeping and that had the ability to send uh, frequencies uh, to someone. And that opened up a whole world of research that became very well known among the UFO people, among people in the truth movement. Dr. Lear had discovered that there was implants, that there were implants of some kind, highly sophisticated implants being put into people's bodies that were uh, electrical, that were beeping signals, and uh, he started doing operations on people. Uh, he did quite a few and saved these little uh, little metal implants uh, as evidence. And there's been some very famous cases. Uh, about his uh, his you know, his finding of these metal 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 implants. Now the implication is horrendous. Uh, the idea that you can carry inside your body somewhere anywhere uh, a piece of metal which is beeping a signal and you don't know it. Well, we can talk about how that's possible because obviously. If you get a piece of metal by chance uh, uh, in your arm or in your hand, it's going to be infesting, uh, infesting very quickly, and you're going to see it. And you're going to know there's something wrong in your in your leg or your arm, 
and you need to have it removed quickly because the body will uh, show you that you've got something that's foreign to the body and it wants it out. But these implants, nobody knew were in their body, no matter where they were, until they happened by chance to get an x-ray and the little uh, beeping uh, uh, implant began to show up on x-rays. That's the only way they knew it was in there. We could talk about how that was possible later. But uh, Dr. Roger Lee has written many, many books and traveled the world, and I do mean traveled the world. <laughs> he was all over the earth uh, continually in, the, in, the, uh, in Asia and in Africa and Europe. Uh, in Russia, he went all over the world giving lectures uh, to audiences about the medical uh, findings uh, that he was having in taking these little metal uh, implants out of human bodies. And so, uh, and and he, as I said, he wrote many books about it, and there are many uh, videos out on the uh, on the uh, YouTube with Dr. Roger Lear. So you go to the YouTube after the program and go to YouTube and look up Dr. Roger Lear, L-E-I-R. And you will see him doing the operations. He will explain to you what he's doing, how these things operate, how they work. It's just an extraordinary knowledge to know that humans on the earth all around the world are being implanted uh, but with some kind of a homing device, which, you know, they don't even know is in their body, and they wouldn't know ever unless they haven't happened by chance to have had a um, uh, an x-ray. There were a few very famous cases where uh, the people found that they had this, uh, 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 Whitley Strieber, I think, was one who had uh, an implant, and Dr. Lear was telling me about him. So, uh, <clears throat> well, as I said, he had many books. And uh, my dear friend uh, Paul Tice down in San Diego with the Book Tree Publishing and the bookstore uh, has published uh, Dr. Lear's book. So you really want to uh, hear about Dr. Lear and get his books. It's a set of books. So with all of that said, uh, I want to bring on my dear friend, Paul Tice. Hopefully he's there. Are you with me, Paul? Yes, with you here again. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, that's wonderful having you on. Paul and I have been very, very close friends for many years. We've, we've had so many opportunities to meet strange and interesting and fascinating people together and to know these people and work with them. And so, like I said in the beginning of the show, we just thought it would be nice to uh, reminisce for an hour each week on important people that we have known and worked with and set the matter straight because so many uh, uh, articles have been written about the famous people that are not true. And so we thought we'd like to tell the, the people the real truth about some of these very wonderful people and friends that we've met. Um, so Dr. Roger Lear is the subject for tonight. The doctor in Los Angeles who had been taking alien implants, and that's the only word you can use is alien because they were not, the, even the metal itself uh, did not have the qualities that metal does on this earth. So he was able to establish that uh, the metal the superstructure of the metal itself was not of this earth. So somebody was implanting humans like we do, animals and dogs and cats and animals, uh, for whatever reason. And not necessarily were these implants being put there to track people, because obviously whatever technology was able to do this and how it worked, was so sophisticated they didn't need to know where you were with that kind of technology they would whoever was doing this would know how to find you they would know where you were 
So what were these implants really doing, and what were they all about, and who was putting them into people, and how is it possible that they were found deeply inside uh, human bodies, human uh, in, in their feet, in arms, and legs, uh, and hands, but deep inside, where you'd have to, you know, like Dr. Lear did so many times, have to go in and cut and go way inside the the human tissue to find it, and then to cut it out and bring it out and put it out for people to see, uh, and then send it to a laboratories for for you know governmental laboratories to to test and see what these things were. I just think the whole subject is just absolutely a mind trip, thinking about how we humans are being tagged by somebody who has the technology to do that and do it in such a way that your body and you both will never know they did it. I know how uh, Dr. Lear has talked with both of us, but he talked with me often about how these things work, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and why the body did not recognize the the piece of metal as being foreign to the body and cause an an infection. So anyway, uh, so what I was saying about uh, the book tree publishing, Paul Tice has got all of Dr. Lear's books. He was a publisher of of Dr. Lear's books, and so he has a whole series of uh, very important books from Dr. Lear that you want to know about and you want to get. So with all of that being said, let me bring uh, Paul back on so that I'm not the whole, uh, I'm not hogging the whole show, but I'm just so very impressed with the work that Dr. Lear was doing. I want everybody to appreciate and understand how important his work was when he began to show the world that we humans are being implanted with some kind of an electrical device which is beeping a signal and we'll talk about that signal too in a little bit later. So, Paul, you have uh, published books by Dr. Lear. You have them now, I'm assuming? Uh, yeah, we'll always have them because of his work being of, of such great importance. Um, you know, Dr. Lear was an extremely intelligent man. He was a uh, highly respected uh, doctor in Los Angeles, podiatrist, as you mentioned. And <clears throat> what happened was <clears throat> he... Um, developed an interest in the UFO field, so he started to go to a few of the conferences and things, and as he explains it, uh, somebody approached him after one of these conferences and um, asked him if he was a doctor because they had had, they suspected that they had some kind of an implant, this was a woman, and so he um, thought it was the most ridiculous thing that he had ever heard. I mean, he, to him, he had never heard of such a thing, and he didn't really believe in it. And then he went to another conference and was approached by this same woman afterwards, and she said, please, Dr. Lear, she says, you're, you're a doctor. You're the only one. If, you could, if you're interested in this subject, you know, please believe me. There's something going on here, and I would, I would like it if you, you know, would please be able to take this out and get it out of my body because I know that it's not supposed to be there. And so... You know, he thought about it and decided, well, you know, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll do this. And, and, you know, he did it and, um, he was one of the first people, if not the first person to ever remove something like that. And from there, he became convinced that definitely there is something going on. He, he went on to, to remove a number of uh, implants from various other people. And some of these people would, um, uh, have hypnotic regression and and recall the fact that there were beings in their room and they were brought somewhere and um, they felt a pain and and all of a sudden, you know, later on they're able to regress and remember this and look and see that there's a scar in this particular area. And other people uh, had no idea that any of this happened. Suddenly they would discover some kind of a bump or a scar that they had no idea where it was or where it came from. And they would um, 
you know, their personality would change just a little bit or something strange, uh, just enough so that they'd know that, you know, uh, and with no explanation with this thing being in their bodies, they would suspect that something like that had happened. And yeah, so, and, and, uh, and all of them, uh, I need to throw this in too, all of these people that he operated on, they had no scar tissue on the outside of the body uh, at all. There was no way to tell because the uh, whoever, uh, whatever it was that was able to go in, cut into your body and connect this little the electrical device, but then uh, coming back out of your body did not leave a scar, period. There was no way to tell that anything had been, uh, you know, uh, nothing was in your body that you could see or feel. And uh, Dr. Lear told me one time the reason, a couple of things about these little devices. One, as he said, they were electrical, and they were sending out uh, signals. And the particular signal that all of these little devices were was, was broadcasting on was the same identical frequency that NASA has developed for their space flights. And it was a very, very secret uh, special frequency that only NASA was allowed to use and that even other governments in the world did not know about this uh, this frequency. And Dr. Lear didn't even know about it until one of the uh, uh, laboratories that he sent these things to be tested to see what they were they one of them happened to tell Dr. Lear, and incidentally, the frequency that this little uh, this little object is beeping on is a particular frequency that the astronauts use to communicate with Earth. And so that was interesting. And then uh, Dr. Lear confided in me also how did these things work if they were electrical, if they were they needed to be you know, have a battery or something. And he said that. Whoever was putting these little devices in you uh, was able, they had the technology and the brilliance to know how to connect their little devices to your nerve endings in your body. And they would pick a, 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 a larger nerve ending and connect it to this little object so that your biological electrical body the electricity your body, uh, you know, produces 24/7. That's how you are able to move and to live, is because you're a biological, electrical, or a battery, so so to speak. And so these little uh, objects would be connected to a nerve ending, which fed electricity to these little uh, beeping uh, uh, instruments. So that's fascinating. And he said in the second part was um, why the body could not see them and you would not necessarily feel them uh, unless, of course, they were very close to, the, to, to your skin where you could actually feel it by just touching the, the spot. But most of them were deeply embedded in the arm and leg and whatever so that you wouldn't know that there unless you took an x-ray. Well, he said the reason why the body did not, on anyone, the body did not report something uh, foreign in it is because he said they discovered that these little uh, electrical devices, very small, but they were, they were covered with a, uh, uh, he said, a plastic-like, a celluloid or plastic-like film uh, wrapped around these devices as if they took the device, uh, connected it to the nerve and then dumped it and then dipped it into some kind of solution which sealed it. And, uh, and in that plastic sealing, uh, of this device, your DNA from your body was in that plastic material so that the body would not see it because it has your DNA in this material that was wrapped around this little device. So your body did not see it because it's it's your own DNA. And so whoever was doing this was very clever to know that the body would show quickly unless you seal it with some sort of a solution or some sort of a plastic material 
and in that material coat it with your your uh, DNA so that the body would not even recognize it. So I just thought that was interesting. And whoever has that kind of technology to cut into your body, and when would they be doing it that you wouldn't know? It had to be when you're sleeping. And so somebody was able to cut into your body, put a little electrical device that has a coating with your DNA on it and connect it to a, a, a nerve ending in your body to power it and put it back and then sew you back up in such a way that you would never even see a scar and you would never even know it's there. So I'm saying that whoever was able to do this and did it many, many times and has probably done a lot more times that people don't know yet, uh, it implies it was not human. You know, you'd have to, if a doctor's going to do something like that, which you can't, we don't have that kind of technology, and we can't do it while you're sleeping. So whoever was doing this uh, this implanting of humans, uh, you can say what you want, you can mock it and laugh at it and think it's nonsensical and silly, but the fact is that he had quite a few of these. I think he said there were either nine or 13 uh, different ones he himself kept and uh, and had them tested at universities and laboratories around the world, one in Germany, one here in America, others around the world. He had these things tested, and every time the test would come back and say, these are not from the earth, we don't know what they are, but they are, they have the capacity to beep out a signal. So what does all of this imply? I don't know what it implies. I just thought it was fascinating. And it, all the, the one thing I do know about it is it was true. And I've seen some of those uh, articles and and uh, other people have uh, heard them and their experience uh, when they were talking about the operation and what Dr. Lear was able to do. So I just think that's very important to keep in mind. This is not fantasy. It's not some UFO silliness. This is le- this is legitimate medical discovery of metal implants in humans that are beeping some kind of a signal, and whoever put it into the people are very highly technically sufficient to do such a thing. So I just think the whole subject is a mind trip, and the implications are are overwhelming. And so <clears throat> that's why Paul and I uh, wanted to talk about Dr. Lear's uh, work tonight. Again, just go on the web to Dr. Roger Lear, L-E-I-R. And if you want to get his books, which are phenomenal books, strange and interesting stuff he was talking about the, in relation to these these uh, little uh, electrical devices, Paul at uh, his store called The, T-H-E, The Book Tree. Uh, and he'll tell you, give you more information on where to get these books and where he is in San Diego. Uh, anyway, uh, Paul, I'm sorry to rattle on, but I wanted everyone to understand the significance of this whole story of what Dr. Lear uh, oh, yeah, accidentally you- happened to fall upon. Yeah, you you knew him uh, uh, just a bit better than than I did. In fact, you uh, I think you knew him quite a bit better than than I did, because you were both living in Los Angeles for many years and spent a lot a lot of time together. And so, um, you know, I was just really impressed with his research because, you know, number one, nobody else was doing it, and number two, he was doing it right. He was doing it. He was sending these samples off to the very best labs i mean for instance like one of the samples that he got back i mean they did find inorganic and organic constituents i'm reading here with large amounts of magnesium copper aluminum and some rare earth elements and these rare earth elements did not match any of the 65,000 known substances and compounds in the computer database of this research facility and so, you know, when you can't identify this, and, you know, um, there's okay. also um, a quote here from uh, the documentary that he did. He did a documentary called, uh, uh, based on his work, and it was called Unsealed Alien Files. It was a TV documentary. And it, the narrator to that said, with multiple labs confirming the objects are extraterrestrial, 
the only question that remains is what's the ultimate purpose of these implants? And yep. we still don't even know that today. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, he passed away before he could, you know, get these tested to, to the extent of discovering that. But he did actually prove that these were not of the earth. They were extraterrestrial objects that were found within human bodies. And how the heck do you explain that? Um, right. you know, um, another quote from, from John Greenwald, who was the, he was the founder of the blackvault.com. I mean, he has come forward and said, and this is another quote, from a laboratory to say something is extraterrestrial, you have to look at the meaning of that. This is something not of this world, but a scientific lab has confirmed that an object connected to an alien abduction story by somebody who has no rhyme or reason to have a, have a piece of meteorite in their arm has something that a laboratory labels extraterrestrial. To me, that's pretty big. And so yeah. this, I mean, this is real scientific findings. And, and what had happened was when, when Dr. Lear has, you know, done this and presented this stuff to the world, he was actually under attack um, by authorities who had come to him and have tried to, to uh, um, uh, force him to drop the uh, calling of himself as a doctor. And I don't know if you remember that, but he was telling me that he was under attack and they were trying to get him to stop using, to, to, for him to stop calling himself a doctor. And because well, I didn't that know gave, that, but uh, yeah, but he was he was definitely a doctor. He operated on many people over many many years, and was well known in Los Angeles. So he was a doctor. But I, mean, I know why because government people do not want this kind of knowledge uh, getting out into the world of mankind that there are in actual fact extraterrestrial life forms here that are not indigenous to this earth, but are from somewhere else, and their technology is so far superior to us that they can put things in our body when we're sleeping and track us and uh, and do all kinds of things to we humans that we will never even suspect it. That's how uh, far advanced these extraterrestrial um, what the government has finally agreed to call them as EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities <clears throat> or alien life forms from other places in the universe who have come here and are implanting metal objects into people to somehow or another, and that's another subject we have to get to, the actual purpose of these electrical uh, uh, beeping objects that Dr. Lear began taking out of people. What was the purpose? And uh, and I asked him one time, was it to to, to track you, to, to to know where you're going and to track you, uh, you know, which was, you know, you could do with a car and you could do what, uh, you know, if you have a little beeper, you can stick it on the car and then you can watch where it's going. And so I asked him, is that what the reason for the implants were, so that somebody from other worlds who are here can track you and know where you are? And he said that was his opinion. He didn't know for sure. And he said, but I don't think so. Because of the people he talked with, the other scientists around the world, that he was confiding all of this information with, uh, he said the general consensus was no they're not tracking you as such to know where you are because they're too smart for that. They know where you are. Anytime they want you, they know where you are. But they was uh, putting something in your body which was able to um, to monitor your evolution. They can monitor your body to see if you were sick, if uh, if um, you know whatever it is that's going on inside of you and your body they could tell uh, instantly because of these little implants. I've heard that as well, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily, he said, I, I, you know, we don't know for absolute sure, but it appears that these little things, these little uh, electrical devices were able to monitor your body and monitor your your life 
and they could tell if you you know if you're sick or if you got a disease or something and why well it may be because they own uh, or they created you or they are are using you uh, yeah, which we do we do that with 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 pigeons and and birds yeah and we, if you put little homing devices on them but they don't know i mean they don't yeah. know they just do what they do if you're an advanced intelligence and you've gone to another planet and you've found the new life forms, you want to understand them. I mean, you just basically, it's a, possibly a biological monitoring device in order to understand how life unfolds and how it carries on within, on, within a different ecosystem or something of that nature. You're right. That's right. So, um, right. you know, but other scientists, um, this, this wasn't just something that, that Dr. Lear, I mean, you mentioned and, and the other scientists had stepped forward to support him because they saw the evidence. I mean, for example, yeah. um, there's this uh, Robert W. Kuntz. He's a nuclear physicist. I mean, he he came out and and uh, and in support of Dr. Roger, absolutely brilliant guy. And um, he said um, he said, however, I he said uh, I realize that federal authorities are unlikely to open to openly address this matter. And my opinion is that mainstream news media will not write even a single unbiased article on the subject. I mean, the media never, yeah, and it's true, the media will never open, openly discuss this. But he said, nevertheless, it is true that extraterrestrial persons are placing implants in the bodies of U.S. citizens and U.S. scientists. Yep. And yep. If, if it is true, he said, I'm sorry, he said, if it is true that extraterrestrial persons are placing implants in the bodies of citizens and scientists, then the matter is of a national security nature that could be more serious than the threat from Al Qaeda and North Korea. Yeah, you've got that right. So I mean, you've got these brilliant scientists coming forward and 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 bringing and out and agreeing the on, on the severity of the situation. Yeah, because you know there there have been reports for years that um, that the government had maybe made some kind of a deal with these aliens in order to trade um, secret technology, you know, and allow them, in exchange for allowing them to, to uh, abduct our citizens. And yeah. if that has been occurring, because it was basically said that, that none of our citizens would remember any of this, and then our, our, our base, basically our, our scientists and governments would get this secret technology that they could carry on um, you know, and what's really interesting is when you read about um, uh, that book, The Day After Roswell. Yes, yes, know? that was and, that's what I was thinking about. The doc, uh, uh, what was his name? Phil Corso. Yeah, Philip Corso, and I mean, he yeah. was the top general in the army at the time that that the, of the Roswell crash, and he wrote a book exposing the whole thing. And um, you know, basically. Um, after this so-called crash at Roswell, it was uh, uh, only a matter of time thereafter, and he said that he was responsible for taking each of the different pieces of technology that was discovered within this craft and bringing it to different laboratories uh, across the uh, country to uh, back-engineer it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that opened the can of worms for later on to negotiate with them for more stuff, but it, after... Uh, after this had happened, it was really interesting where fiber optics, night vision, uh, all kinds of stuff like that came out all at about the same time because a lot of this stuff had been back engineered through that. And so they say that as a result of this, um, we wanted more stuff. And some, and after, uh, like the Roswell crash, we had, there were other crashes too where alien beings were actually found, injured, and that sort of thing, whereby uh, dialogue was opened up, and we apparently, uh, I believe it, it may have been under Eisenhower, I'm not sure completely, but I think that's what when the deal was made, according to some of these sources, that they said that we would, you know, allow all these people to be abducted. And my point, getting back to Dr. Lear, is that a lot of people, more than you would ever think, had been abducted, and a lot of these implants could be in people, and they'll never even know it. That's right, and they will never even know it <clears throat> because those little implants, as I said, were covered uh, after after they were connected to your nerve endings. So the 
whoever was doing this to you when you're sleeping knew exactly where to place that little object because it was a nerve ending that they could connect to that object some way, somehow, so that your nerve ending was feeding electricity to this little object, and then they would seal the whole apparatus, very small and tiny, but they would seal it with some kind of a solution or or a plastic-like material with your DNA embedded in that material so your body would never see it, and your body is always an electrically uh, charged thing, and so you're continually giving electricity to this little object to beep its signal, and your body will never know it, and you'll never know it. So I, I just think this whole subject is just a phenomenal. Uh, it, and then when you see that it's actually backed up <clears throat> by many different uh, authorities who have checked it out and who have done experiments on these little uh, devices, and all of them are saying basically the same thing. This kind of metal is not found on the earth. We don't know what it is or where it's come from or what it's doing, but it, we know one thing. It's, it's actually beeping a signal, and uh, so yeah, and it, I know really, that- it really begs the question, what's really going on here? Yeah, and I know that, um, you know, there are people who have claimed to have had implants and, and had scars as well, and that may have been early on in the game, but you're absolutely right about the fact that, you know, in, 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 uh, Dr. Lear's, his first book, The Aliens in the Scalpel, he talks about how that was the one thing that really blew his mind, is that how many, uh, different nerve, um, parts of the different nerve receptors were actually in these implants so that it just kind of almost attaches into your nervous system because and then that could be what you're saying is is uh monitoring you know what they're monitoring because when you've yeah. got all these what nerves, are they monitoring yeah yeah when you've got all these nerve re- re- receptors in the actual implant that are connected to it or in either a symbiotic way or or, in, or directly in some some nature then there definitely would have to be uh, a re- the reason behind it would have to be to monitor that in some way. So it makes sense that it's in, in a, on a certain biological level, there's being you know there's being uh, studies being done in that respect. Yeah, and he said Dr. Lear told me once that uh, that he had talked with officials uh, and they told him that this particular beeping signal was, as I said before, was uh, a, a very readily well-known signal to those in the position to know about it that was used by NASA to communicate uh, with the Earth and with their satellites and with the uh, ast- and with the astronauts. It's a particular signal that nobody is allowed to use, period. It is, it is so highly guarded, uh, uh, you know, frequency, and no one is allowed to use it ever except NASA. And, uh, and so, and then he said, but these little, uh, devices that he was taking out of people's bodies were broadcasting on that particular frequency. So as clever as we are and as smart as we think we are, somebody was able to very simply, like a, an adult to a child, was very simply able to take your, what you think is so important and so well hidden, and laugh at it and put it into a little metal device and uh, use that as a transmitting signal. So it's not only showing that uh, that whoever's doing this is superior to anything we have at NASA, far superior to any kind of minds and brains that we have in, uh, in the, on the Earth today, is so far superior that it's just mocking us. It'll use our most important uh, frequencies. It will put uh, implants into your body in such a way you'll never know it. They're playing with you. They're playing you for a fool. And uh, they'll mock, they, you know, it's just amazing the technology which is all around us and in us, and we don't even know it because it yep. has nothing to do with football or anything important. Well, Dr. Lear was also, because he was privy to such incredible evidence, he became really um, interested in trying to prove that they were here in in other ways. So uh, what had happened was in 1996, 
there was this uh, UFO crash in Brazil, and in fact, that's the title of his second book, UFO Crash in Brazil, A Genuine UFO Crash with Surviving ETs. And this thing in Var- Virginia, V-A-R-G-I-N-H-A, in a <laughs> small town, very small town in Brazil, uh, in broad daylight, uh, this, there was a crash, and there was these aliens that one of them was, you know, these three girls were getting out of school, and right in the, in the main part of town, one of these was running around, and it, they, they had cornered it in like a back alley, and it was crouching against a wall, and they were scared to death of this thing. Another one had broken its leg. The fire department showed up and used nets to, to actually catch it, and they brought it to um, uh, a doctor, and he was told by the military had shown up by then, and um, they brought this being into this doctor's office, and they and they put armed guards outside the the door, and they would not allow this doctor to leave until he actually mended the broken leg of this being, and you know Dr. Lear went went all the way down to Brazil to interview all these people and find out about this because when this mm-hmm. happened it was amazing, you know actually when this happened uh, it was reported in the Wall Street Journal. Now, because it became such big news, and it was it was something that was very credible. I mean, when you get you get a report like this that shows up in the Wall Street Journal, I mean that just doesn't. It's not that's not the National Enquirer by any means. No, so, no, and, and and he went down there. I think right. he was invited to come down and check out this whole situation by A.J. Gavard, I think. Yeah. yeah, and and he was very interested, as you said. He became very, very interested uh, in researching uh, the whole idea of extraterrestrial alien life on the Earth. Yeah, and he and was he, a doctor. He had a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. So he interviewed the doctor who actually repaired the leg, and the doctor you know, told him the whole story and everything. And um, he interviewed other people and eyewitnesses and... You know, he came away with fully convinced that, yeah, this is an actual genuine crash. So he re- came back and reported it all and wrote this book, UFO Crash in Brazil. And we published that one, uh, The Aliens in the Scalpel. And then his his third and, and final book that we did, uh, also uh, the foreword, was written by uh, astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell. So yes. you've got an astronaut. Edgar Mitchell coming forward and saying, you need to look at this. This is the Dr. Roger Lear's research and his work. You need to look at this. And so um, uh, his third book is called UFOs Do Not Exist, The Greatest Lie That Enveloped the World. And um, mm, yeah, part, yeah. And part and of the Like book, you said, to get an astronaut like Edward Mitchell to do the, uh, you know, to, to comment on the book, and tell people that they need to know about it. Uh, that's very, very impressive. You know, exactly. Very impressive to me. And you know, and and then he did an update uh, with um, about Virginia in the UFOs do not exist book. He went like back down there and got updates. And what had happened was all of the guys in the fire department that captured this alien, uh, all of them got moved to different fire stations all around Brazil within six months after this event happened. And he went back to the doctor, and the doctor uh, was late. He was fidgeting with a pen. He was, like, very nervous, and he suddenly denied everything that had happened, said it didn't exist. It was all based on rumor, and that just floored Dr. Lear because so much of, you know. (laughs) So much had already been given to him by this doctor. Yeah, and uh, exactly. and all the, the uh, and all of the the uh, testimony of other people, uh, yeah. there was it's so all... much there that he came back and wrote a whole book on the subject. Yeah, but, but then uh, you know, the, but then to find out that Brazil was acting like America. If you know something you're yeah. not supposed to know, uh, you better keep your mouth shut, and your life is in danger. Yeah. So um, you know, but we do have these. Three books by Dr. Lear, The Aliens in the Scalpel, UFO Crash in Brazil, and UFOs Do Not Exist, The Greatest Lie That Enveloped the World. And the the interesting thing about Dr. Lear's work is that nobody's doing it anymore. You know, yeah. and it's 
it's it's a real shame because he proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that this was something that was not of this earth and it, it probably he's the only one who has ever proven that extraterrestrials are had to have been here because you're finding these implants in people and and it's not coming from this planet so right. how do you right. how do you explain that i mean he's the only one who's actually proven this and in these books in the in the back of aliens in the scalpel and UFOs do not exist. There's such highly technical scientific uh, data and information and results of studies there that a lot of it is beyond me. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but and then you've got people, credible scientists, coming forward and saying, yes, you know, this this matches up. This is, you know, stuff that is, is scientific evidence that it's valid. And so, I've heard um, scientists say this is about as scientific as you get. All of this information is right on target. We just didn't know about it, but Dr. Lear was telling us, and now we look at this and we're finding out everything checks out and that uh, this is very legitimate uh, information that's telling us that we are not alone in this universe and that somebody came here from somewhere else and are very highly technically brilliant uh, intelligences who can operate on humans and we will never even know it our minds we won't see it we'll never know it they wipe it out of our memory and uh, and fix it so that we don't see any scar tissues and we go through a whole through uh, all through your life and never realize that you've been somehow or another being tracked by an electrical electrical device well other so, doctors uh, who are capable of doing this type of work and are of the mindset that Dr. Lear first had was that this is crazy and it could never be real. It's just National Enquirer type stuff. I mean, Dr. Roger Lear was there. He he was of that same mindset, but he was bold enough and curious enough and uh, even, uh, you know, um, compassionate enough to, to want to try to see if there really was something there. And yeah. it blew his mind, and it set him on a course that, you know, no one else has been on except um, maybe someone in the future who might maybe uh, check out his books and, or check out the, the, the factual scientific evidence and maybe be convinced to, to take a further look at this and continue on the work in some way. Well, I met a, a surgeon, a doctor, a very, very impressive doctor, uh, contacted me, and I met with him and uh he was uh, he was on call 24 hours a day as a surgeon in Los Angeles and um he was telling me about his his uh his investigation of Dr. Uh, Lear's work and he was saying uh, you know the stuff he was talking about other surgeons and other doctors would only you know, only they would know uh, those terms that Dr. Lear was using and he said, and that was very impressive to him. There was no doubt in his mind that Dr. Lear knew what he was talking about because he used all the right language, all the right technical uh, terms, etc., to describe what he was finding. And uh, this doctor said to me, and he's a, and that's what he is as a surgeon. He's on call to other hospitals continually. And he said, there's no doubt in my mind that whatever Roger found is is exactly what he said it was. And um, so that's interesting uh, that other doctors are, are recognizing uh, that Dr. Lear knew exactly what he was talking about. So, yeah. And then in, in this last book that he wrote in 2014, UFOs Do Not Exist, The Greatest Lie That Enveloped the World, I mean, he had just finished it, and we were we got the proof, and we were sending the proof to him for final approval, and then he passed away. And mm. it, I mean, he just barely got this book out. And when you look at this book, it is monumental. I mean, his best proof is in there. This is the one where he lays it all out.